<laughs> what is up guys welcome back to a brand new reaction and today we're watching how was england formed we're going way way back in history and we're learning how was england formed i don't think i was ever i well i might have been taught it in school but i don't remember it for the most part in like most of my history classes we we learned about like american history that's about it we learned a little bit about like british history but not much and i've had a few of y'all send me this video and say it was a pretty good video so i guess today's the day we learned so we're about to get into it go use the channel hit that subscribe button we're trying to hit 100k once you do me a uk theme tattoo we're actually like super close we're like i think less than seven thousand away that's insane shout out to y'all also be dropping some tattoo ideas down in the comments it's a uh, it's coming soon drop a like if you want to see more reactions like this go check out my second channel link down in the description but other than that let's get into it The existence of England is one that is often taken for granted and looked at far too scarcely. This may be due to the overshadowing history of the development of Great Britain and the United Kingdom. But nonetheless, in order for these unions to be formed, England had to already exist, and it actually has since 927 AD. So how was England created? Excuse me? 927? Huh? Who claimed That's the ridiculous. land before the English? And how did it become the nation that we know today? Hey. As the Roman Empire began to fade from the British Isles, the area of modern-day England started to see a wave of migration from Anglo-Saxon Germanic tribes. According to some historians, after the Romans left, the native Britons came under attack from the nearby Picts and Scots and subsequently welcomed some of these Anglo-Saxons in hopes that they would push out the other invaders. Wait a minute. Ain't that that's Ireland, ain't it? Why do you say Scots? Did the Scottish originally come from Ireland? Yo, y'all let me know. The Germanic peoples were successful in expelling both the Scots and Picts, but they then turned on the native Britons and established their own authority by the start of the 7th century. Oh, the gosh. new Anglo-Saxon rulers then installed the kingdoms of Essex, Kent, Sussex, Mercia, East Anglia, Northumbria, and Wessex on the British mainland. There are minimal records of what happened over the next few centuries throughout these kingdoms, but we do know that it wouldn't be long before the Anglo-Saxons would face invaders of their own. In 793, Bro, this is intense. <laughs> a Viking army landed at the Lindisfarne Monastery and raided the sacred building. Their violence and disrespect stunned the Anglo-Saxons, who were unprepared for what these Vikings had in store. Bruh. By the end of 870, East Anglia fell to the Danish invaders, and Mercia was lost only four years later. As the Vikings seized Northumbria next in 875, Wessex was the only remaining major kingdom under Anglo-Saxon authority. When wow. the current king of Wessex, Ethelred, died, his younger brother, Alfred, was left to protect his kingdom's independence. At first, he did so by paying off the Viking aggressors, until he was eventually prepared to lead an army against them. This culminated in the Battle of Eddington, which left the Danes utterly routed and ended their attempts to capture Wessex. A power vacuum in Mercia around the same time resulted in King Alfred also gaining control of the kingdom, and instead of establishing a new monarch, he placed an alderman in charge. This nobleman would answer to King Alfred himself and kept the King of Wessex as the ultimate authority throughout both regions, although a part of Mercia would be ceded to the Vikings. After the death- Bruh, fighting Vikings just seems insane to me. Like, like I know they were real, but Vi just the idea of going to a battle with Vikings just seems like a movie to me. That's insane. The King of Wessex and the contemporary leader of Mercia in 911, Edward the Elder and Ethelfled, each became the respective successors. Together, these new rulers began to increase the pressure that had already been put on the neighboring Danelaw. In 917, Ethelfled expanded her lands to the north, and Edward was able to incorporate all of East Anglia into his kingdom. Oh yeah, let's As take Ethelfled it back. pushed forward with the expansion, she managed to extend Mercian territory all the way up to York, where the locals decided it would be best to simply pledge loyalty to her as opposed to fighting. Although Ethelfled shortly died, 
Her daughter, Elfwyn, was supposed to take her place and continue on the current course. Unexpectedly, though, the Mercian people quickly ousted their new leader, and accidentally created the perfect opportunity for King Edward from Wessex to seize all of Mercia not long after. Bruh. In 918, the Anglo-Saxons continued farther into Danelaw territory, and slowly gained more and more land for themselves. By the time of Edward's death in 924, the newly acquired neighbors of the Anglo-Saxons had all pledged allegiance to the king. This put the Anglo-Saxons in a confident position as Edward's son, Ethelstan, took over the kingdom. Around this time, Ethelton's sister would marry the local Viking ruler, Citric, who literally all of their names have started with ETH. <laughs> Ill controlled Northumbria. Ethelstan marched on and was finally able to bring the Kingdom of York under his crown as his sister's husband passed away. This left Northumbria up for grabs and the king swiftly consolidated it as part of his kingdom. This is generally the time that most historians view the Kingdom of England as having been created. Huh. But the situation was not exactly so simple. Ethelstan was not done trying to expand his kingdom however he could, and although he did term himself the King of the English at this point, it was still not quite what we know as England today. Ethelstan decided to give an invasion of Scotland a chance to see if he could reach his authority even further. The Kingdom of Scotland, or as it was known at the time, Alaba, was at a disadvantage against the English, and therefore appealed to the other remaining sovereign states for assistance. This prompted an alliance between Constantine II, King of Alaba, Olaf Guthrison, King of Dublin, and Owain, King of Strathclyde. With King Strathclyde. Olaf at the helm, the Alliance faced the English at the spectacular Battle of Brunnenburg. Though it is unknown exactly where this battle took place, nobody just had a civil conversation. <clears throat> nobody just had a civil conversation back then, did they? Like, oh, if, they, if they wanted something, they just instantly went to a battle. <laughs> Certain that the Alliance was severely crushed by the English invaders, the casualties on both sides was disastrously high. But Ethelstan and the English were, without a doubt, the victors. Wow. It's believed by many that this clash may have truly solidified the unity of England and stirred up a new sense of nationalism and pride amongst the English people. Nonetheless, it didn't result in the incorporation of Alaba nor Strathclyde into the Kingdom of England, as both stayed independent. England, on the other hand, would have to prove its ability to do so. The Vikings, though temporarily defeated, would return to the Young Kingdom at the end of the 10th century. After Ethelstan's death in 939, the previously defeated King of Dublin, who was a Viking ruler, took immediate advantage of England's temporary instability. While King Ethelstan's brother Edmund took over the English realm, King Olaf swooped in to reconquer some of the lands that had once been in Viking Bruh. hands. York was quickly captured and a large chunk of what used to be Northumbria and Mercia was also taken, as he strong-armed the English into accepting this annexation. This just kept going back and forth. They, they give it, they take it, they give it, they take it. <laughs> Ironically, when Olaf died in 941, and his cousin, who shared the same name, was transitioning to the throne as his successor, Edmund of England jumped on the chance to pay the Vikings back for the invasion. The following year, the middle chunk of annexed land was retaken by the English, and in only two more years, the Vikings were entirely pushed out of Northumbria. Bruh. This essentially reunited England, since the territory was now all under Edmund's control. As ambitious as his ancestors, Edmund next invaded Strathclyde, but only took some of its southern territories by the end of the incursion. The rest was given. I like to how Wales is just chilling. Like <laughs> nobody's gone in there yet. Nobody's really messed with it. Nobody's there. They're just they're just there. <laughs> King Malcolm the First of Scotland, as opposed to joining England, it once again appeared as though the Kingdom of England had established some stability. But this was once more short-lived. Edmund was mysteriously murdered in 946, which left his younger brother, Edred, as king Bruh, of England. Bruh, they need to get off the E names, dang! <laughs> the next year, Eric Bloodaxe from Norway attacked. And Excuse me? Eric Bloodaxe? Yeah, no thank you. You're telling me 
that dude, uh, a dude named Edred was sitting there, and they're like, "Hey, we just got attacked from the from the north by who? A man named Eric Bloodaxe." Yeah, just give it to him. He can have it. He can have it. He's <laughs> the recently incorporated Northumbria, which prompted almost a decade of conflicts over who throughout the Isles would lead Northumbria. Wow. Eventually, the English king was able to once again and permanently reclaim the territory on behalf of England. His death soon ended his reign after this victory, and his young nephew, Edwig, temporarily succeeded him, but was quickly deposed in favor of his brother, Edgar. Yeah, bro, there is no more E names. Like, meant there is no more E names that they could possibly use. Like, there's not another E name in the freaking English language that they can use. They have gone through all of them. That is... That is insane, <laughs> bro! Oh my God! That Edwig would still hold a small section of the kingdom as a co-ruler. When Edwig died, only two years after this decision, Edgar simply took over the whole of England. It's like as soon as they do something like good or like something for the country, they die. Like as soon as something good happens, and they're like, "All right, you know what? We're actually we might be in the lead. We actually might have this under control." Done reign of King Edgar, known as Edgar the Peaceful, the true foundations of the English kingdom could finally be established. Okay, Many reforms were passed, and a vast number of the systems and laws that had existed in the Dane law were actually upheld in hopes of avoiding any displeasure from the Danish portion of the population. Peace, unity, and order were the pillars of Edgar's nearly two decade long reign. And I like work, Edgar. He, he came with the love. I got you helps to fully solidify the unity of the young kingdom of England. Hell yeah, Edgar. The ultimate foundation of England was a long and shaky process. From the initial immigration of the Anglo-Saxons into the region to the establishment of their first kingdom. Yeah, the fact that it started off with what, like six or seven different kingdoms, and then it turned into like two people battling, then three people, then one person owned the whole thing, that's insane. Extending into the invasion and rule of the Vikings, it wasn't until the Anglo-Saxons began to seize territory from the Danelov that an inkling of modern-day England could be seen. After a series of conquering, being conquered, reconquering, <laughs> and so on, the Anglo-Saxons eventually united the existing kingdoms throughout England. From there, it was merely a matter of establishing solid borders, maintaining their captured territory in order to keep their kingdom physically solid, and eventually, under the rule of Edgar the Peaceful, building the foundational laws and structures of what we know now as the kingdom or nation of England. That's dope. That, that was really dope. That history and just the... The history of the battles with the Vikings coming over and all that, that, that was dope. Well, that story is a lot cooler than how America was formed, so. <laughs> but alright guys, that is going to do it for how England was formed. That was really cool. I'm glad I watched this. That, going that far back, messing with Vikings and stuff like that, that's insane to me. Y'all let me know what y'all thought down in the comments. If y'all want to see more reactions like this, let me know by hitting that like button. If y'all are new to the channel, hit that subscribe button. We're trying to hit 100k. Once you do me a UK theme tattoo. Thank you guys so much for watching. Make sure y'all go out today. Spread love. Spread kindness. Do something nice to somebody today. I love you guys so much. I really do. Appreciate your reaction. I'm out. Peace.